so I was the first guy on Beauty and the Beast. They, um, I got a call when I was on Roger Rabbit from um, Jeffrey Katzenberg, who is the head of the studio. And he said, you know, we want to try Beauty and the Beast. We'd like you to produce it. And, um, you know, Walt Disney tried it, but uh, they couldn't quite crack that nut. But, we, you know, let's give it a try. And I thought, wow, no pressure there. Um, so, uh, you know, again, you go looking for great people. And originally I found, um, we went to Richard Williams, the great animation director of uh, Who Framed Roger Rabbit. He couldn't do it at the time. Uh, but his protege, Richard Purdom, was able to do it. And we spent several months with Richard and a writer named Linda Wolverton, who's exceptional, um, and, and worked on the movie that way. Uh, eventually that film, and we did an amazing unit. We worked in London for several weeks. Uh, we had people like uh, Glenn Keane, Tom Cito, Andreas Deja, Tom Enriquez, Gene Gilmore, uh, Mel Shaw, working on Beauty and the Beast back then. Just developing it, doing artwork, imagining what it could be. We went to the Loire Valley in France and we studied chateaus and we drank wine and it was just wonderful. <clears throat> but the movie wasn't coming together. It was, it was beautiful, but it was a little like animated masterpiece theater. Um, at the same time, uh, Mermaid was coming out and there were two songwriters on Mermaid that were just setting the world on fire, Howard Ashman and Alan Menken. And so we went through a variety of changes, including a change of directors and, um, and it was radical. I mean, we really threw out everything and started over again. Um, the new directors, Kirk Wise and Gary Trousdale are, are brilliant. You know, they, and it was a battlefield promotion. They had never directed before. They had done uh, a small movie for the Life and Health Pavilion at Epcot Center, for those of you who have Epcot's geeks out there, called uh, Cranium Command. They had done the pre-show for that, and um, it was fantastic. And so we said, well, let's, um, let's make Kirk and Gary the kind of interim directors and see how they do. Well, they made an Oscar-nominated film. I feel like it was, it was it, you know, we, we, we were thrown on it because they were in basically a pretty desperate situation. When, once we weren't the first choice for directors. Yeah, yeah, they pretty much... They, we weren't the second choice for directors. I don't even think we were the third. But... No, we weren't. <laughs> but we because... were available at the right time. Yes, exactly. And we didn't screw up Cranium Command. Exactly. So they they kind of like. Oh, they didn't screw it up. Let's exactly. They kind of, right. They kind of like Cranium Command. That turned out okay, and they worked their ways sort of through a bunch of different artists. And they said, "Well, I guess we, uh, let's give it to these guys." Um, you know, there might have been more to the decision than that, but that's how it felt at the time. And, and so we really were, you know, dropped into the deep end of the pool. I mean, one minute Gary and I are, are story artists just drawing our funny cartoons and making ourselves laugh. And I think and we next, were drawing, I think yeah. we were working with um, with Tim Hauser on Goofy yeah. of the Apes at yeah. that Goofy. time. Yes, it was Goofy as Tarzan. We were both working yeah. working on that. And then, you know, before we knew it, we were on... Uh, we, got, we got called into Charlie Fink's office and he goes, can you, this is like a Monday morning, like Monday morning at 9.15 a.m. It's like, can you, can you guys be on a plane on Wednesday to New York? Uh, you might get to direct Beauty and the Beast. We were both like, uh... We thought it was like a candid camera episode. <laughs> you know, it's like, we're being pranked, right? <laughs> exactly. I guess the tricky part of it all was they... It was... Uh, Jeffrey Katzenberg brought in a new way of doing animated features that was more akin to live-action features. So there was not... Um, there, there were, they weren't used to having a screenwriter. It wasn't, they weren't used to having a single voice and it was usually done with the story department. And so that was a little um, difficult for me because I didn't know how it worked. Um, and also being a woman, because it was very much a male dominated environment. Um, it's, but, you know, I just felt, especially with the story of Beauty and the Beast, I really felt it was important to bring a modern Disney heroine to the world. You know, I grew up on the, the 50s Disney heroines, and I felt really, after, certainly after the women's movement, that we needed to take a shift there. Um, so that was that was another absolutely pure drive for me, and, and it made it worth it to stand for who I believed she was. She's part of the Renaissance, you know, princess resurgence of strong women, and um... You know, they started doing this with Ariel, you know, and it's the it's the Howard Ashman, Alan Menken, you know, uh, it's, it's their vision of what they want. They wanted strong women. And when I say, you know, my my portrayal as Belle was Paige, I have to say it's also Linda Wolverton. It's also James Baxter, Mark Han, you know, and all the people who worked on this character. So we're, we all kind of share 
Bell. And actually, in some ways, there's Howard Ashman as Bell too, believe it or not. But I think it's because of, um, I think it's because of her independence. She wasn't looking for a prince. She she was smart. She's very independent. She's very nurturing. And I think as I've gotten older, what I didn't appreciate as much when I was in my 30s and now in my 60s, I do, was that she did not hesitate to give up her life to save her father. And, um, and then ultimately the beast at all, they save each other. And I think that that kind of story will resonate forever. And of course, Howard and Alan were, I, I, you know, there's, there's a whole, whole hour to do on Howard and Alan, but um, they had a tremendous gift for storytelling. You know, that's if you want to say what Howard and Alan's gift is, that it's, it's not just their music uh, and their songs, but they understand how to integrate songs into storytelling and how to make songs really part of the fabric of a movie. So you're not stopping to take a bathroom break and, and you're wishing the song was over. You're actually invested in the songs. So that was a big part of that, that kind of overhaul rewrite. I learned so much from Howard. I think I was so lucky to be sort of like a, like an acolyte at the knee of a master at the very end of his life. So we didn't know it was the end of his life. I think Howard did. Um, and it's very bittersweet to think about it now. Um, but I felt like he he pat he was passing he was passing on things to me. And he never would have chosen me. It's just how I happened to land there. You know, this girl from California. Um, he was incredibly sophisticated, you know, uh, very you know, sharp wit and he didn't suffer for fools. So you really had to have your, you had to have your game on with Howard. And, um, but I learned so much. You know, one of the, I remember there was a moment when we were talking about um, Disney movies, animated films, and he, was, and he was talking about every single scene in a Disney animated film has an umbrella of emotion around it. There's this sense of, with almost every scene, there's this feeling of emotion. And he talked a lot about Geppetto's workshop and what that was like, the light in the workshop, the warmth of the workshop, the aliveness of, of the workshop and the, um, the home of it. Um, so I have brought Howard with me through my entire career. I mean, I just brought him with me. And um, sometimes, I'm writing something and I think, you know, Howard would think this is really terrible. So I have to not do this. <laughs> so anyway, so Howard is huge mentor for me. Uh, and really, I, I feel very blessed to have been put in his presence. Howard yeah. taught us a lot. When Kirk yeah. and I went into this, you know, and, and particularly when we were going to New York for like the casting calls, we weren't really all that up on like how to do this, particularly with music for me. Um, I, I didn't know that much about Broadway, didn't know that much about, about singing, and Howard and Alan both were a wealth of information on how to talk to, how to talk to singers and performers, how, how to get a performance out of them, you know, how to, how to interact with them, like from the control room to the, to the recording room, um, and what to look for, you know, what, what kind of things to, to look for in, in a voice or in, a, in, a, in an actor or an actress. And, you know, we were like, holy crap, it was like, it was, you know, it was a masterclass in, you know, kind of rush time, but um, it was, it was so, so informative. Yeah, Gary, Gary's right. I mean, I remember in my earliest, uh, very earliest voice recording sessions for, for Beauty and the Beast, um, uh, Howard was there and Howard would offer suggestions, yeah. and Howard would talk to the actors, and um, I picked up so much from him, just as Gary pointed out. In, in just in just how to give an actor direction, and uh, uh, particularly a voice actor, um, and you know I sort of patterned my style after his style, eventually yep. you know, eventually finding my own. But 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 he was my. But that's where we started. Longest you know, influence. Yeah. That was that he was our mentor in that. Yeah. You know, I mean, when when he said to to a to a singer. Uh, I, I want I want more of a head voice and less of a less of a chest voice, or make it more legit, or you know, just like all these terms. We were like, oh. what? <laughs> okay, write that down. You know, I mean, it was it was really fascinating. Find any one person, I think, in 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 uh, 
uh, kind of at ground zero of, of what's been called the Disney Renaissance now, um, I'd have to say it was Howard. I mean, obviously there, there are lots of other people involved who created these movies, but it was Howard's approach to storytelling and Howard's approach to, to musical storytelling in particular that really changed the course of, of, the, of the animation department. I remember being so intimidated by him the first day in the studio and he kind of broke the ice and I was like, I, I was trying to raise my voice and trying to sound younger and blah, blah, blah. he said, whoa, Ethel Merman, stop. <laughs> this is, the, what are you doing? I want your voice. And that was like, I kind of like said, and he took me aside, he said, we want you. And that's what I was talking about before. If you put Paige into this, do your own voice, maybe a little softer, like Gaston, you're positively primeval. You know, just a little softer version of my voice. That's it. But ultimately, your, it's your personality and, and, and your spirit and your heart we wanted this character. So that helped me a lot. And I just fell in love with him that day. And, mm -hmm. uh, and then every time we recorded and got together, the, and especially, oh, I have to share this with you. The day that we recorded the, the music, we were with essentially the New York Philharmonic, most of those people there. And it was live singing with them. The chorus were Broadway stars. I mean, amazing. They just wanted to be a part of it. But I remember him coming up. You, I mean, you might have seen this footage before, but he kept coming. He, I, was, I was singing Little Town, It's a Quiet Village. And he was like, no, I want quiet. And I did like 25 takes just on that one line. And then I got into the song, and I think I did it in two or three takes. But it was um, that quest for perfection. You know what? He was right to keep pushing me to do the, that phrasing. And uh, ultimately, it, it really made a, an impact that first when they first hear Bell sing. And, uh, but I was, I was pretty intimidated by him at the times, but totally in admiration and love with him. So My agent said, you know, all these voiceovers you've always done your entire life, um, would you want to go and audition for this thing, Beauty and the Beast? And I went, of course. And they said, because they haven't found anyone yet and they've been looking. And uh, I thought, well, I'll, why not? So, um, so I went and I sat there and I was reading the, the lines and um, I could hear in the room where all of these other actors, some very, very famous actors were going in there and they were blowing out their voice, doing the part of the beast. And the more that I read these words, the more they came to life for me. And it was no longer a cartoon to me. And, um, and I thought, you know, I, I wanna play this like it's a film. Like it's a film that meets a Broadway show. I remember that like like it was yesterday. And I just went up and it was like, Belle, are you happy here with me? And I just got in there and I knew that the more that I could give resonance and body to the sound and, and true feeling, you know, to, to the words and, and make it come to life, not like it's a cartoon, the more it would be meaningful, at least to me. I, I had no idea what they were really looking for. I, I just went, this has got to be what I think is right. And even singing in Beauty and the Beast, because they didn't want the Beast to sing. And then Paige, who played Belle, said, you know, Robbie's been on Broadway, he just came on Broadway singing. You know, this is, you, you have a singer. So they wrote a little song and I got to sing. And that was fun and it was really cool. The one time that I did get a chance to be in the studio with almost everyone, they flew us to New York. The next morning was when Angela Lansbury sang Beauty and the Beast. And we were all standing there in I mean, just in awe of watching her perform. And again, most of us who had worked on Broadway, and that's a lot of us in the cast, 
had done Broadway albums before. Like when I did the song Something There, my part, they got my level for when I sing. I did one take, one take. Wasn't, didn't get a second shot at it. But you see, that's how you do it when you're doing a Broadway album. And, um, and she did the entire song. And, you know, I mean, I had goosebumps. I'm getting goosebumps now. It's like, she was magnificent. As a matter of fact, look, every performer in this, in this film is magnificent. Uh, in everything that they did, I, I just am, uh, I, I just am so proud to be a part of their work. And also, honestly, I mean, Glenn Keane, who drew the beast, he brought the beast to life. You know, I was lucky enough to give it a voice, but the real DNA is, you know, it's the artists. It's and Linda Wolverton, the writer. So you have all these incredibly gifted people working together. And it wasn't about succeeding all the time. You know, I, I think that's important to point out. Um, the creative process is full of misfires, but to create a safe room, and again, that's I suppose what I do is create a place where you can say anything and you can contribute to the movie, regardless of how crazy it might sound. Um, I'll give you an example. One day we were listening to um, Be Our Guest and Be Our Guest was sung to, believe it or not, to Maurice, to Belle's father. And uh, Bruce Whitside, one of our story guys, um, and the executives were there, big room full of people, high pressure, all that stuff. Towards the end of the meeting, he said, you know, I think we're singing Be Our Guest to the wrong person. And everybody went, no, oh, oh come on, uh, you know, no, that's ridiculous. And then after like a, a beat or two, we thought, you know, he's right. And we went through and we hired the singers back and we changed all the pronouns and we moved it later in the movie and it's sung to Bell and it works great. So those are the kinds of radical things you have to be open to regardless of your creative process. I, I make films, but I, I, the same kind of uh, iterative process applies if you're a writer or a painter or a poet or a cook. You know, you have to go through and try things until you get to the point where uh, things are really firing off for you. So um, that's the kind of uh, brief story of uh, Beating the Beast.